Hello, you're listening to WPPMLP in Philadelphia, and you're watching live on Philly Cam TV on Comcast and Verizon. I'm your host, Vanessa Maria Graber, and this is the People Power Lunch Hour Show. This month on People Power Lunch Hour, we are talking elections. And we'll be talking to groups all around the city who have help, been helping all of you get more civically informed and engaged. We'll talk with Pat Christmas, who's from the Committee of 70. And in the second half of the hour, we'll talk with members of the Philadelphia Bar Association's Judicial Commission. Stay tuned for all that and more on the People Power Lunch Hour Show. We'll be right back. Hello, welcome back to the People Power Lunch Hour show. I'm your host, Vanessa Maria Graber. We're really excited this month. We're talking about elections here in Philadelphia. And wow, is it a big election month here. Biggest city council election I think we've ever seen with more than 30 candidates um, just for at large. And every single district is being challenged for the incumbents that are running. So we're here to talk about elections and how you can get informed. And I have with me in the studio, Pat Christmas, and he is with the Committee of 70. And Pat, you've been doing a lot of work over the years, but you have been working at the Committee of 70's Signature Election Program, which includes high school election ambassador corps, the Voter Experience Survey, Voter Rights and Responsibilities Campaign, and a comprehensive voter guide. If you aren't familiar with the Committee of 70, you should definitely get familiar. They have a lot of really great resources to help you navigate these types of elections. They're a nonpartisan civic leadership organization that advances representative, ethical, and effective government in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania through citizen engagement and public policy advocacy. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. So uh, tell us um, what you all have been working on with this election. Of course, we have a really competitive city council race, and I think it would be really great for some of our listeners and viewers who aren't acquainted yet with some of the resources that your organization has to offer. Sure. So the Committee of 70 has been around for a long time, and local government and politics is our specialty, uh, going back to 1904. So this this election year is our year. I mean, we, we care about the gubernatorial election you know, years and, and, of course, you know, presidentials and, you know, the U.S. Senate and Congress and all that. But, you know, when we have our city elections, like, these are the ones that matter immensely, and they, they affect folks on, on the ground. So, you know, I just, to, to, to give a quick rundown, um, yeah, the city council elections we have this spring are, are huge. Um, we have a 17-member council here in Philadelphia. This is our legislative branch uh, in, city, uh, in city government. We have 10 district members, 10 geographic districts across the city, uh, and seven at large. And, and all of these seats come up at the same time. Um, and you're, you're right. This is, this is the, the largest number of candidates we've had going back to 1979. Um, and I think we could we could probably put out a number of hypotheses about why that why that is. But I, I think the good news is that we, people are running. We want people to run for these offices. And city council has you know immense powers, especially you know passing our budget. You know, city has a, a budget of more than four and a half billion dollars, um, and they they also play a huge role in in land use decisions. We, you know, the selling of city land, of which we have a lot, um, uh, the vacant land that is, um, and uh, and our zoning code, which kind of which kind of sets the rules for what can be built. You know, here you know here here and there. So they have a, a huge role in, 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 uh, in, in the daily lives of, of, of uh, city residents. But there are, all the, there are other offices that go that are way, that are way, other, way under the radar that also uh, matter a great deal. Uh, we have row offices, row offices in, in Philadelphia, um, several of them. They are, uh, there are three uh, called the city commissioners. Uh, they oversee our elections here in town and, and voter registration, big deal. Um, we have a sheriff. We have a sheriff in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, the sheriff's office is responsible for um, providing security for our court system. 
um, and it has a role in the uh, foreclosure sale process, um, both both consequential. And then lastly, we have a we have a register of wills, uh, which you know deals with obviously like the documentation that, that comes up when when someone uh, when someone passes. So you know those offices are, are, are very important. We also have judicial uh, elections com coming up. I understand the uh, the folks from the from the bar are coming in later, so I'll let them cover cover those. Which again, they matter immensely. And and these offices, many of them, and the candidates. Uh, are, are are difficult to 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 follow. I mean, that we don't they don't have a ton of money to run to run issue ads. This is not the stuff you see on on cable television, um, but it's the stuff that's closest to home. So it's it's really really important that that folks tune in. Yes, and just to clarify about this particular election, it's a primary election. So tell folks who is eligible to vote in the primary election. Yeah. So Pennsylvania has a closed primary system, which means that only registered Democrats and Republicans can vote for candidates in our spring primaries. Um, other states do it do it very differently. And I, you know, maybe we can we can come back another time to talk about all the different primary systems, which matters very much to the 70. We think we could do it differently. Um, but you know, folks need to know that if they do want to vote for candidates, they do need to register for one of the two major parties, D's or R's. Uh, and the voter registration deadline is, is April 22nd. So if you are not registered as for one of those parties yet, or if you're not sure, uh, go to PhiladelphiaVotes.com. That's the city's election website. Um, they have the, the, the links to the uh, voter registration uh, tools that, that folks would need there. Um, I will note, though, that uh, we actually have a whole bunch of folks in town, uh, more than 100,000, who are unaffiliated. They're not associated with any political party. Um, and uh, and folks who are registered with a third party, Libertarian, Green, uh, Green Party, Socialist Workers Party. You know, there are a bunch of third party uh, folks out there. Um, and they actually have stuff to vote for as well. Uh, we will have four ballot questions um, on the on the ballot this uh, this May 21st. Um, and again, these are these are these are questions that uh, you know some of them are, are kind of um, uh, 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 kind of informal ballot you know informal referendums on something that actually doesn't have a hard consequence. Others others are, are real changes in government. Um, all of this stuff will be on 70s voter guide, which should be up actually just in a week or two uh, for folks to get uh, get the skinny on. Yeah, I think there's a tendency from some people who are longtime party members to vote a straight ticket, mm -hmm. and then they get into the voting booth and see the ballot questions, and they're like, oh, oh no, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't prepare for those. Mm -hmm. So what can people sort of do to like do their homework to mm -hmm. answer those ballot questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I, you know, I'd, I'd say the, the best place to start, not just to, to flag 70s stuff, but you know, we've, we've covered the ballot questions um, every election going back as far as I think anyone in our office can remember. Um, we do take positions on them from time to time uh, when they're direct, when the, when the scope of, of, our, of our mission. This this particular election, uh, we, we won't be. Um, to give a, a, a you know quick preview, I, I, you know one of them is about um, having uh, uh, kind of traffic uh, uh, traffic uh, personnel, um, or, you know, in, around the city to help. I think d you know decrease the number of accidents we have, which we which which we have a, a, a good number. Um, so I, I think the the best thing to, to do um, would be just to go to 70.org. Um, in a, in a couple of weeks, it'll be it'll be up for sure, um, and these questions will be will be front and center, uh, and, and and folks can uh, can look them up. Um, uh, and the, the the same is true for these for these other offices. I mean, you actually just great question though you just mentioned like you know walking in and just voting for you know for republican just straight ticket republican democrat straight ticket uh, uh, democrat it's also really really important that folks put some thought into which democrats or which republicans are, they're going to vote for because uh, there are some big differences right um especially you know with this race it's it's very very competitive especially um you know with some of the districts it's maybe one uh, or sorry two or three people but with the at large, you definitely <laughs> have to mm -hmm. look at all the candidates. I think you can vote for up to five um, this time around. So check out Philly Cam. We have been interviewing the candidates and we'll be putting up our video voter guide with as many candidates as possible. If you're a candidate, uh, come on down and, and participate. But I think social media is really a great way to generate some discussion around the ballot questions. I've seen people post a question and say, like, what do you think? And that's where some of the most robust debate I've mm -hmm. seen with some of these more complicated questions. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend too, you know, post those questions up there, see what people think. Yeah, yeah, and and if if, if you come onto our website, um, and the, the and the questions will be listed also on the PhiladelphiaVotes.com dot uh, com uh, website. The, the the question, and then actually the uh, state law requires that a that a plain English or plain Spanish uh, explanation be provided as well. Um, that's written by an attorney and, and um, is 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 helpful more helpful than than the just the one sentence question that, that's put on the ballot. Um, but the the other thing I'd stress is like if, if you if you go through the descriptions we have on, on the on the website, um, our contact information is on there. Drop us a line if you have another question or, or concern about it. Um, reach out to us and we'll and we'll get that question or concern answered. 
All right. You heard that straight from Pat Christmas. <laughs> I'll be looking for all those emails. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it's important to ask and, and find out, like, you know, what exactly it means and, and how it will affect you and your community, because yeah. these questions all don't affect everybody equally, right? Um, one of the other things I wanted to talk about is the work that Committee of 70 has been do doing in combating corruption, playing a major role in the adoption of civil service reforms. They open up and improve the voting process and our political culture, electing honest, capable people to office and helping government work better. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, it's been a long road. <laughs> <laughs> and the work is never done, that's, right? Well, that's right. But I, I think this needs to be said first. So, you know, Philadelphia and, and, the, and the state of Pennsylvania uh, actually have a, have a long tradition of, of highly transactional, individualistic, and, and at times corrupt politics, um, which, you know, note is not exclusive to our city and to our state. Um, it's it's really it's part cultural. Uh, we have a political culture that is that that is more vulnerable to, to bad behavior, and it actually kind of extends across the Mid Atlantic, and, and it actually moved west uh, and stopped in Chicago and Illinois. Also, if, if there's a city and state that's very similar to us politics wise and corruption wise, it's 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 Chicago and Illinois. Um, but uh, Philly has made huge strides forward um, over over the past century, and and even in the past 15 years, um, Philadelphia actually because we had a a major scandal uh, and. Uh, uh, 2003, when uh, Mayor uh, Street was uh, was still in office, uh, on the heels of that scandal, we passed campaign finance limits. We passed uh, pay-to-play rules. These are rules around city contracts and making sure people can't basically purchase their way into, into city work. Um, and we created a, a new, independent, powerful board of ethics uh, to enforce these rules. And it's actually put the city of Philadelphia uh, in the vanguard as far as local jurisdictions go um, in their in their ethics infrastructure. Pennsylvania is still. Uh, uh, woefully inadequ inadequate and kind of like the wild wild west um, but the city of Philadelphia is in, in, in pretty good shape I will I will go ahead and also note though I you know, we did have a major indictment uh, a couple months ago and so obviously like we still have a lot of work to do um, like you know local 98 um, and, the, and the folks that were indicted there huge headline um, you know we'll have to see how that plays out but um, and even uh, about a year and a half almost two years ago with the district attorney yeah uh, Seth Williams so you know it could still happen. That's why we have to have watchdogs. Yeah, well, and and we and we need people to run for office. I mean, part of the problem is is that I think our, our political system again forever um, is has been far too insular and kind of stagnant. Um, and folks, you know, not only I think are they less likely to, to make bad decisions and, and have bad behavior, but they will perform at a at a higher level um, when there's a bit of competition there. So that again, that's that's all the all the all the better why we have all these people running for council this year. Yeah, I've been frustrated at times um, in elections where I see people running unopposed. And uh, I, I'm, you know, I think like, wow, not one person mm -hmm. is out there that, you know, could at least uh, put their ideas right in the marketplace because not all elections are about winning. Some of it is just about creating debate and dialogue and putting a focus on certain issues. And so I, th I think like, wow, what a missed opportunity to put some other ideas yeah. on the table. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. That's that's such a big problem in that in that in, in our local elections here in Philly, so many uh, so many races they're not even contested. There isn't even a challenger, uh, or if there is, you know, it, it's not someone that like that has a true a true constituency that's gonna you know and, and who's gonna put a specific agenda forward. Um, but I think that's what's what's a little bit different this year, uh, both in the at large races and, the, and there are a number of district races where there are, you know, credible candidates who are fundraising. They have a you know they have a policy agenda to put forward, and the and the discussion debate we have in the spring and the, and because the Philadelphia is a democratic stronghold it is the spring primaries where they, we have this debate and this discussion um, it's really important we have that so you're you're absolutely right and, and again so glad that so many folks are running this year yeah again you know it's it's an opportunity to just highlight different ways of thinking or addressing all these issues that affect us here in the city I wanted to talk again about um, redistricting. Uh, last time we had folks from the Committee of 70 on the show, we also highlight this, but I think it becomes even more important when it comes to elections. Can you talk a little bit more about Draw the Lines PA? Sure, sure. So um, Draw the Lines PA, is it's a citizen mapping competition that 70 uh, has launched in the, in, the, in the past year or so. And, and in short, we have software available that's both sophisticated enough to resemble what the professionals use, um, but it's accessible enough for, for the layperson, for the average uh, uh, citizen, for the average, average Pennsylvanian. Um, and we're going to have successive rounds of competition. We just had the last one um, in um, uh, uh, last uh, spring. And uh, we had uh, we have uh, multiple divisions, a high school division, a college and, and higher ed division and a kind of a, a adult open um, and uh, uh, also like regions across the state. You know, the idea here is that, you know, we ran uh, congressional um, 
uh, congressional competition in the, in the in the last in the first round. Um, 18, 18 districts because that's the number of seats Pennsylvania has right now. The the fall twenty nineteen competition is underway, and we're having folks draw a map of Pennsylvania with U.S. House districts only seventeen because we're predicted to lose one after the twenty twenty census. Um, we'll have that round of competition, and then we're going to move on to the state senate maps and then the state house maps. Hopefully, by the time we get to 2021, regardless of whether or not a, a, a reform of some sort has been passed, if we're stuck with the status quo processes, which are not good, um, at least we will have not hundreds, but thousands of Pennsylvanians who are ready to draw their own maps and take those to their elected officials and say, hey, this is the way the line should be drawn in my community for X, Y, and Z reasons. Um, and that's something that Pennsylvania, nor any other state really, has ever had before because, because the technology didn't exist. What do the districts look like in Philadelphia? <laughs> That's a great question. What shapes are those? <laughs> yeah. So city, uh, we, again, we have 10 city council districts, right? And, and so we do have to remap our city council districts as well uh, every 10 years after the census. So Philadelphia's council districts, uh, the previous ones, not the, we have, we have, the ones we have now, the previous ones were among the most gerrymandered in the United States. It was it was it was bad. It's just you know one of these one of these where you throw them up on the map on, on, on a screen. It's like a raw shock test. Like any reasonable person is going to say like these maps have not been drawn you know in a thoughtful way f you know to make sure folks are represented fairly. Uh, they've been drawn to advantage some person or some group uh, or disadvantage some person or some group. Um, th the maps we have now are are much more coherent. I guess we'll say. Um, uh, and they line up uh, uh, with the, you know, the ward boundaries. That's some of the, the language we have in our charter, which is kind of like our local constitution. Um, you know, the, the current maps are, are you know, contiguous and, and compact and, and as sensible looking, I guess. You know, it, it is important to note that when you look at a, a map of a, a political, di political districts, if they seem to be in, in you know, compact, reasonable shapes, that doesn't mean there, there isn't some uh, foolishness going on there. Um, but the, the city council maps we have now are far better, for sure, objectively, than the ones we had previously. Um, and in, in, in Philly, it is our city council, you know, the politicians themselves, who draw their own maps, which generally is not a good practice at the city level or at the state level um, <laughs> ever. So this, I, we also plan uh, to run the, the, same, the, same, uh, the same play, Draw the Lines uh, uh, Philadelphia having folks draw their city council maps as well after the census and, and you know council members hopefully taking taking all that uh, input into account and and giving us a set of boundaries that the, that the people want so for folks who don't know what gerrymandering means the best way to describe it is if say i won an election and um you know i'm serving office and i'm running for re-election and i want it to make it easier for me to win i would draw my district around all my family's houses, all my friends' houses, people who think like me, people in the same socioeconomic um, bracket as me, and uh, that would, would be the map. It would be a nice, crazy, squiggly line around all those communities, instead of the actual communities I'm supposed to be serving that might be people of a different race, a different socioeconomic background, and even different politics. And so that's what gerrymandering means. And if you look at some of the old maps, you will scratch your head and think, what the heck were they <laughs> thinking um, in drawing, especially the federal uh, maps. Some of them uh, look very strange. Uh, yeah, they, they, they sure do. And, you know, one, one important thing to note is that the, at the state level, um, because, uh, uh, you know, the, the reality exists, there's, there's partisan gerrymandering. There certainly has been in Pennsylvania. We're going to try to limit the amount of partisan gerrymandering in the next cycle. And, and partisan gerrymandering, just, just like you said, is, is drawing those lines in a certain way to get folks in your district who will be favorable to you. And in, 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 in this case, folks of your, of your party. Um, in Philly, because this, the city is overwhelmingly Democratic, uh, there just there are far fewer opportunities for partisan gerrymandering. I mean, uh, their voter registration uh, rate is about 8 to 1, Democrats to Republicans. Uh, most of the Republicans in the city live, live in the Northeast or, or in parts of South Philly. Um, but the, the gerrymandering we would see in Philly was actually just like you said, like it's your, it's your friends and supporters, your political supporters, um, or, 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 other, or, or, or other factors. I mean, in, the, in a previous set of maps, um, there, there's a large uh, Latino community up in North Philadelphia. That community was, was cracked. It was basically divided among multiple districts to ensure that uh, someone from that community was not going to win uh, a representation there. Um, and that's exactly the kind of thing that we, that we cannot have. That's how they can like split the vote. That's right. And that's mm -hmm. how people become disenfranchised mm -hmm. when they're not able to win those elections. And that's how people continue to get reelected, right? Uh, so we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about an event that's coming up at WHYY with Committee of 70 and look ahead to the 2020 election. You're listening and watching the People Power Lunch Hour at Philly Cam. We'll be right back. <laughs>
welcome back to the People Power Lunch Hour show. I'm your host, Vanessa Maria Graber. This month, we're talking about elections, and we're bringing in different people and groups that are organizing around elections here in Philadelphia. Here with me, I have Pat Christmas, the executive director of the Committee of 70, a group here in Philadelphia that does a lot of amazing work around elections and other public policy making. And again, they're a nonpartisan civic leadership organization that advances representative, ethical, and effective government in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania through citizen engagement and public policy. So if you go to their website, you'll see a number of initiatives that they offer. One of them is We Vote. In recent elections, only 17% of registered voters went to the polls in Philadelphia. And to combat this, Committee of 70 is launching We Vote, an initiative to promote a culture of voting in businesses, organizations, and communities in the region. Can you tell us a little bit about We Vote and how we can get people out there? Sure, sure. So, so uh, We Vote is, is a project that uh, my colleague uh, Lauren Cristella uh, is over is overseeing and, and managing. The the idea here is that um, part of increasing voter turnout over the long term is is to change ch- change a mindset, and both as as, as an individual uh, and as a community. Um, you know, one of the ways we talk about turnout in our office because you know, of course, we, we're going to do that when. Where we uh, where we live and work, uh, but it's it's also it's always a question, especially in these in these uh, these local elections. You know, there are certain procedural things that can change. You know, the way our absentee ballot process works, voter registration. Um, you know, you know hurdles. Other other states have same day voter registration, which a lot of folks think you know make that makes that easier. Um, those require changes in law and are, are quite difficult. Difficult. So th- those are kind of process things that can influence turnout. Um, there's also kind of tactical um, uh, means that can be taken, uh, and these are these are. Uh, proven uh, with, uh, with with evidence, but they do they do co- do cost money. Uh, examples of this include you know micro targeting through uh, through social media. Uh, one of the, actually one of the uh, you know best examples of this a, a study found that sending a, someone a postcard um, with their voter record and the voter record of their neighbors, um, or even better their their friends or family, if if the if the folks running this program is able to get that information, um, will will increase someone's likelihood to vote by 10, 20 uh, percent at, at, at times. Um, but the, the the third and I think most important uh, kind of part of this, as far as increasing turnout goes, is as again changing changing mindset. So we so we vote is about um, working with uh, organizations of all types, you know, nonprofits, uh, you know, churches, labor, uh, pr- you know, private companies, and, and encouraging them to start uh, a voter turnout program of sorts in their in their organization. And there's kind of a, a menu of things um, that they can do. Uh, making voter registration applications available, sending out a notice to folks uh, before certain deadlines, obviously before election day, um, but then also um, a, Lauren's helped develop a, an, an app that has um, all the information you can need to be an informed voter. Um, and I think this information is a particular importance in an election like this where it can sneak up on you. Uh, again, you're not seeing too many TV ads, and there are all these offices that you're, you're not going to be familiar with, perhaps. Um, so it has links to our voter guide, links to our voter rights and responsibilities cards. Um, again, the kind of things like you no, know, the typical voter should not be expected to to know their 12 most important rights on election day, but they should know where to look, um, and hopefully they can have most of the stuff in the same place. Uh, and that's what this program is about. Okay, so you heard it. Go to their website 7d.org and check out We Vote. It's under Get Involved, and that's one of the ways that you can help get voters to come out and be more civically engaged. Speaking of which, you have an event coming up um, with WHYY. Tell all our listeners and uh, viewers about it. Sure. So this is uh, this is a bit of a rerun from an event uh, that was also hosted at HYY in, in 2015. Also, when we had a fair number of folks running for running for city council, um, and I think this is the most exciting thing about it. I mean, uh, candidate debates uh, and forums are a really important way for folks to hear directly from these folks running for office and, and why they deserve a vote. Um, you know, the challenge, as I think, as, as we've already mentioned, is like there are a lot of folks running, uh, and and we have ten different uh, uh, council district races, but then we have this this at large scrum. Um, and so you can't line up all the, all, the, all these folks on the same uh, uh, you know panel, or you can try. It's it's difficult, um, and like kind of walk them down the line and try to get, tease out what their positions are. So in 2015, we ran uh, basically w- what was kind of like a reverse job fair. Um, each uh, council candidate had a uh, had a space, a table they could bring their their campaign staff if they if they wanted to, um, and uh, inten- attendees were invited to come in and they wandered around. They they spoke to the different candidates. There was a handout that told them like where folks were. They could look up um, which district they were in. Oh, I'm in District Two. 
okay, so those candidates are over the, the far side, and the at-large folks, I can vote for up to five of those, so I'm, I'm going to make sure I speak to them too. Um, and so we're running the same play. Um, HYY we've, uh, is, is going to host again. Uh, I think we've, we've got most of the candidates uh, you know, confirmed, um, and it's going to be a great opportunity, I think, not just to, not just to meet, the, meet the candidates, but, but be surrounded by folks who are getting really plugged in on this, uh, on this election. And it's April 22nd at HYY. All right, you can talk to the candidates yourself because sometimes, you know, when you watch those videos, they're they're all nice, right? Like yeah. everyone has a nice campaign video, um, but it's it's something different to talk to someone in person to be able to ask them questions. Um, they recently hosted um, a People's Forum, um, which Philly Cam live streams. So if you want to check it out, go to Philly Cam's Facebook page. And I really liked the format because people got to ask all the questions, and they had. Um, signs that said like yes that. or no right mm -hmm. like if they support it that and so um you know all the people that were speaking were were people from the community so mm -hmm. um it's sort of like shifted the power back in the people's hands mm -hmm. yeah and, you, and i think that was uh you know that was actually a great model where you can have all the candidates up on stage and also have and both have the audience engage with those folks directly and quickly get through kind of what their positions are um so that yeah I, that 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 seemed to work uh seemed to work quite well um, the other th so and actually on that point folks uh, when they go to the the convention on April 22nd or any you know, any of the other events that are happening there there are a bunch uh, this this spring uh, you think about what you're going to ask um, and if you can like push for some specifics uh, I, you know the the campaign website can be helpful to start with but the, the language is always kind of like fluffy and and, and nice uh, and, and everyone everyone does that you're not going to put up a campaign can web campaign website that's kind of blunt and you know uh, you know, too, uh, you know, too grounded in like in, in a cold, hard reality. But uh, if if there's a specific issue you care about, schools or public safety or taxes, you know, line up a few of those questions ahead of time. Bring them with you, and then and then push them push them on, on specific, specifically how you get this done. Um, especially yeah. if something's not you know entirely within your within your power. Yeah, exactly. Ask them like, is there a specific bill, policy, or regulation that you're gonna push? Because it's easy to say like, yes, we care about the environment, and a green new deal is great. Mm -hmm. But it's more specific to say, you know, do you support uh, a tax on mm -hmm. on which, you know, is sort of they're talking about now a tax on driving into the city in congested areas? Do you support a ban on, on, on plastic bags? I mean, there's many other specific policies that you can ask them about and get them on record, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you can't. It's a public place, so you can record. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Exercise your yeah, sunshine yeah. laws. And, and ask and ask them how they would convince uh, uh, their peers. Um, where you can't you can't pass a bill on your own. You got to pass it with the rest of the rest of the legislature. So how you how will you get it done? Those are good good tips. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much for all the work that you do and helping get out the vote, making everything more fair and less corrupt. Uh, tell folks one more time how they can get in touch with you and find more information. Sure. So I you know. Throw one web, web uh, one website out there www.70.org. That's seventy spelled out S E V N T Y. Um, everything you need there. The voter guide, the link. We're gonna have a nice little uh, ballot tool that that will make this even easier to look up your candidates. Uh, the We Vote app, um, uh, contact information for our staff. Everything you could possibly need. They're located on South Broad Street, and you can call them at two one five 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 seven thirty six hundred. That was the Committee of 70, and hopefully you'll come back in the fall, and we'll talk more about elections Happy to. For, the, for the big one. All right, you are listening to the People Power Lunch Hour here on Philly Cam Radio and Television. Um, in the next half hour, we'll have folks from the Philadelphia Bar Association's Judicial Commission. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
Hello, and welcome back to the People Power Lunch Hour show. I'm your host, Vanessa Maria Graber. And on today's show and all month long, we're going to be talking about elections here in Philadelphia as a really important primary is coming up in the city on May 27th. With me in the studio, I have a representative, the chancellor of the Philadelphia <laughs> Bar Association Judicial Commission, Shelly Fadulo. Welcome. Hi, Vinna. How are you today? I'm doing well. I'm excited to talk about all the work that you've been doing. The Judicial Commission, of course, um, puts together information to inform all of you about the judges who are running in the election. Uh, the mission statement of the Philadelphia Bar Association is to serve the profession and the public by promoting justice, professional excellence, and respect for rule of law. In doing so, the association strives to foster understanding of involvement and access to the judicial system. The Judicial Selection and Retention Commission evaluates judicial candidates to help voters make decisions about candidates for judicial office. And they make evaluations based on criteria such as legal ability, experience, temperament, administrative ability, integrity, and devotion to improvement of the quality of justice. Is that right? You do all of that? We do all of that. Well, let me step back a minute. I am actually chancellor of the whole Bar Association. The Judicial Commission is one of the very important things we do, and it's a, and it's a part of our organization. But I ha my responsibility is really overarching, and it's for to represent all of our 12,000 members. And um, one, of our proudest, one of our proudest achievements is work we do through the um, Judicial Commission. So tell us a little bit about some of the resources that are available, things that you all have been working on ahead of the May primary. Okay, well, well, the first resource is um, for, for members of the voting public is will be the recommendations we reach. And the recommendations will be available in a number of ways. And I'll, I'll talk about the recommendations, and I think I want to step back and talk about why our recommendations are so important and what goes into the recommendation process. We post our recommendations on our website. We issue news releases, and also we, um, this year, uh, um, stepping ahead, on Election Day, through our PAC, we have a PAC called the Campaign for Qualified Judges, which will be funding part of this and helping mobilize. We will be out at polling places handing out cards, literature, telling the voters, these are the folks who we have vetted, these are the folks who are either highly recommended or recommended. So we will actually be right there for you if you have an opportunity to reach out and see what the resources are that, we, that we're posting. It's really important that people look at judges individually because they're nonpartisan, right? And so when people are used to maybe voting for people in their party or doing a straight ticket, then they, they come to judges, and same thing happens with the ballot questions. They might say, oh, I don't know these people, and I can't just pull the party lever. Well, that's true. It, it, though for the primary, the only um, – in the primary, in Pen it, there, we do not have open primaries in Pennsylvania. So that means if you're a registered Democrat um, – if you're a registered independent, you do not get to vote in the primary. If you're a registered Democrat or registered Republican, the only choices you will have will be the folks who are on that ballot. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not uncommon for judicial candidates to get filed on both tickets, mm -hmm. on, the, on the Democrat and on the Republican ticket. So there's options. Right. And also in uh, the elections that they have um, in the fall, depending on what state you're in, to we'll have a list of judges um, without an affiliated party. Correct. So tell us how you make these recommendations. What's the process like? It, it's a tremendously labor intensive and thoughtful process. And um, I'll, I, I uh, I joined the Judicial Commission in 2017 as an elect as um, vice chancellor of the organization, and uh, the way our organization works is you're, um, one is elected to be vice chancellor, then you automatically become chancellor elect, then you get to be chancellor the third year out, and once you're chancellor elect, you get to serve on the Judicial Commission. Um, other people are on the commission by appointments in different ways. Our commission has um, a set group of people, so we have a diverse group of, of, our, of our association members. So the commission is, is a body that's really, you know, and again, I, I've sat on it now for two election cycles. I'm in the second one here, which takes its work very seriously. But before anyone even gets to the commission, there, there's a whole process that, that, that starts before we even see the candidate. 
And um, first step is, and I actually have a form here that if you're interested in, if someone is interested in running for judge, they're asked to submit a fill out a, a it's called the um, Philadelphia Bar Association Commission on Judicial Selection and Retention Personal Data Questioner for Lawyer Candidates. Now, when I say lawyer candidates, some folks um, already sitting judges, they may have been appointed, they have to run. Lawyer candidates are folks who have never, never sat on the bench. And I'll start out by, and I'm, I'm going to take a pause. You may want to ask questions. Otherwise, I can go into soliloquy sure, sure, here. No, we're here to learn all about this and, process. Um, it's a 15-page form asking m many detailed questions about the individual's background, about personal information, professional information, cases you've tried. I mean, it's really, really a detailed it's, form. It's almost like a job application, right? It, it, it is a job application, mm -hmm. and it's a very and it's a very important job. It's a job that for which you're elected for 10 years. It's a job that puts you in a position of public trust, and it's you know, and, and it's really um, for our legal community, really um, one of the most important jobs you can have is 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 sitting as a judge. So okay, so I'll let you stop now. No, 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 no that's, good. that's good. That's the first step. Okay. They fill out the application, and then what happens? Who reviews that? Okay, well, the application is submitted. We have um, we submitted to the bar association, and after that happens. We form. We have a. We have an investigative. We have investigative teams. I believe we have somewhere over maybe 120 or so. I think they under our bylaws. We have about 120 members, um, maybe give or take, n no more than that, who serve as investigators. One third of them have to be members of the community, non-lawyers, and we have teams of like four people. Um, we usually have one person who's the liaison from the judicial commission. And each team is assigned a judicial candidate. Then I've only I've only actually um, I've never served an investigative team apart from being on the commission as liaison. No, actually, I've done it twice, but each time I was a commission's liaison, and it is a thorough, thorough process. The um, candidate, first of all, is interviewed, and actually, inter interestingly, interviewed in their office, so you can get a sense of who they are, what their office looks like. You know, basic, you know, this basic information that you can, you know, sometimes you can evaluate people based on that. The process includes um, doing a social media search, doing a search of court records to see if the individual has any financial issues that maybe were not but to but to you know that weren't revealed you know and sometimes it could be something is something that happened so long ago uh, that you really forgot about it but you know we still look for it and um and also interview people who um know the candidate and sometime and including people that the candidate may suggest but typically people they, they didn't suggest because you have it's important to get a wide variety of views on the candidate so um it's not unusual to get a call you know so and so, and what are your thoughts about them? What is your reputation? And um, and it's very and and I should also add that this is all confidential. It's very very important to the process. No one can no one can speak can, can candidly if they know that what they say is going to be attributed back to the candidate. So that's really a core part of the process. Allowing people that have worked with the individual to be able to speak, you know, about their conduct, how they have represented clients, et cetera. Well, it's not that that it may be someone you work with. It may be someone on, and typically it's someone on the other side. If you're, especially if you're an if you're a litigator, which many of the many people who um, seek judicial office are, they they they've you know they're they're trial they're trial lawyers. Whether you know depending, it could be a criminal lawyer, or a, um, family lawyer, or a civil or civil lawyer as I am handling civil matters. You do have um, people you've worked with on the other side, and they have an, you know, and and sometimes, I mean, sometimes people will look at dockets, you know, the court dockets, see see what case you've had, and contact someone who was your opponent to see how you handled yourself, and it's not unusual to call judges before before whom you've appeared. So it, it's when you when you enter the process, you have to go in recognizing that that um, you know it, it's 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 that people will be asked about you and they're and they're expected to, and they will be candid about their views of you and so what is the result of that is it some sort of ranking or um a designation or endorsement um say somebody fares really well what does that look like and what if somebody like you do all this investigating and maybe they haven't uh done a good job uh or maybe they haven't played nice or maybe there's some spotty things in their record how does that manifest? Okay, well, when we get to the, um, there's two things. We have the 
and I said the candidate has these de detailed questionnaire, and although the form I'm looking at now is 15 pages, it grows because the candidate adds detailed information. Then the, then the investigative team then prepares a report which summarizes their experiences, what they, what they encountered in, 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 in you know, their assessment of the candidate on multiple bases. And then together, they, the group of them vote on whether that candidate should be recommended or not. And we don't endorse, we recommend. Mm -hmm. Then there's a difference. We don't, we're not, um, so we, we should be recommended or not. And then the, um, t then the, the leader of the investigative team comes to our meetings, which are held every Friday, and, um, and our, which are held every Friday, and as long as it takes to get our candidate, to get the candidates um, evaluated, and makes a presentation about the result of their and I, a, a result of the um, investigation. I can't reveal what goes on typically, you know, in, in, because that's confidential. But just in a generic way, share with share the view, you know, share you know why they reach these conclusions. Provide more information that isn't necessarily in the report because it's you know the report is relatively brief, and then entertains questions from from people on the commission. Um, sometimes the commission will ask because sometimes it's important to put in context, even though that can't be revealed. Who, with who did you speak to? Give us a list of the people. That's a very typical question. Tell us who you spoke to, and who said you know who said what because that's important in evaluating, in, in evaluating a candidate. And then um, so we we get a preliminary report from the can from from the um, from the mem from the investigative team member. Will you continue? <laughs> yeah, and then um, then they either vote to recommend them or not recommend no, them? No, 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 not no? yet. No, not yet. Not yet. yet. <laughs> no, not yet. Then we, we, the candidate is called in and has an opportunity about five minutes to, to, to make a presentation as to why they believe they, they um, should be recommended and what they're going to and what they bring to, the, what they're going to bring if they have the opportunity to be on the bench. And, but before they come in, we as a group, um, Make have questions for the candidate. Um, in the initial round, I'll call the initial round. We we have only the chair of the uh, chair of the judicial commission, which is Teresa Sachs. She's not able to be with us today. Will pose the questions. So we don't want it to be, um, you know, something where where candidate is getting hit up hit questions and well, you know, from different directions. One person asks the questions and they respond. And then typically, you know, they they you know that may they leave. Sometimes we may ask them to come back. We may have other questions, and then the, then the um, then we deliberate as a as a committee of the whole. Well, it seems like a more thorough process than what the city council candidates <laughs> have to go through. I can't comment on that. The city council candidates, but it, it's very thorough. And then we we do vote. We um, it's a secret ballot. We have um, the ballot directs us either. To recommend, um, and there's three different categories. There's recommended, highly recommended, which I'll talk to you about um, in a moment, and not recommended. And um, if if your vote is not recommended, then um, it's it's a, it's important. Then then you are obligated to fill in what area of the area of the criteria that you are concerned about the candidate meeting the um, you know um, that that you feel concerned about. You feel the ca the candidate has not um, you know ha has some um, issues. And at the end of that, that's, you know, th th those votes are compiled. And um, based on that outcome, the candidate is either highly recommended, recommended or not recommended. Highly recommended is a very high, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's really reserved and it requires 90% of the um, folks who were there voting to, to become highly recommended. But this year, so far, we, we're not done with our candidates yet, but we do already have two highly recommended candidates, Anthony Kirikakis which, and, and Tiffany Palmer. So that's good news. <laughs> and we also have some other recommended candidates. We also have recommended candidates. <laughs> All right, if you're just tuning in, I'm speaking with Rochelle Shelley Fadulo. She is the chancellor of the Philadelphia Bar Association, and she also sh serves on the Judicial Commission. When we come back, we'll talk more about the resources that they have on their website for voters who are looking for information about judges who are running in elections in Philadelphia. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to the People Power Lunch Hour show. I'm your host, Vanessa Maria Graber. And this month, we are talking about elections on our show. Earlier in the program, we had Pat Christmas from the Committee of 70 talking about all of the work that they do. And in this half hour, I'm joined by the Chancellor of the Philadelphia Bar Association and also a member of the Judicial Commission, Rochelle Shelley <laughs> Fadulo. And she's been telling us about the process that they use to evaluate judicial candidates and what determines whether or not they recommend them um, in various ways. So we were talking about getting um, highly recommended, recommended or not recommended. And you said the good news is we have two highly recommended candidates. And so that's good for the public. And we also have recommended candidates as well. And again, we're not done with the process. We have other candidates. Friday, so always we go along. If you were to talk to me later in the process, I'd have additional names. But also, um, you know, I mentioned our two highly recommended candidates. And we have recommended candidates as well who, um, who, who, um, th those who were running for court of common pleas are Wendy Barish, James, um, James Burrard, Burrard De Deli, I'm sorry, I butchered his name, um, Francesca Ivan, Ivan Delico, I'm having a bad name with names today, Condra McRae, Daniel Salmon, Betsy Wall, and KU. And for municipal court, which is, um, which, and, and you can, you can follow in both courts, um, and, and candidates make a decision based on, actually often on ballot position, which they're, where they're going to remain or other considerations. We have David Conway and Betsy Wall, who are also recommended. So we do have a number of recommended and two highly recommended, a number of, of recommended, and again, to whom I apologize for butchering their names. <laughs> if you want to read the complete list of names and find out more, you can go to philadelphiabar.org. And then if you go to the left-hand side, it says Judicial Commission, and under their current ratings, and you can see all the information there. We actually have another website if you're interested, and in. it's it's um, electqualifiedjudges.com. All right, that's electqualifiedjudges.com. So in our last few minutes, um, I'd like to talk about why you all invest so much in this work, why do the judges matter, and a message to our listeners and audiences about why they should be paying attention to these races and, and finding out more about the people who are running to serve in the courts. We talk about justice, and we, we think about it, and we talk about a mission statement, and we all talk about justice and rights, and our courts um, and the role of law, and that's where you know, the, 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 our, our judges are the custodians of that. Um, many of us will never see the, I mean, I'm a lawyer, I see the inside of the courtroom, but many people who are in, in their everyday lives never see the inside of a courtroom, and that's probably, hopefully, a good thing, because usually inside of the courtroom means you have a dispute, but when you have a dispute, it, it's the most important thing in the world to you, and um, and again, m many, you know, r really important um Rights and, and personal interests are involved. I mean, it could be a custody matter. It could be you were sued. Somebody is suing you. It could be a criminal matter. And it is really, really important that the judge, and again, the, you know, in many cases it is a jury as well, but the judge is the one who is, who is charging the jury in matters of law and is really, you know, and, and, and really is a custodian of, of our court system. Of, and, the, and the courtroom, you're in that, the judge is a custodian of that. And it's critically important that we have judges who are, um, you know, the, we, we have the best judges we can have. And also those appointments are 10 years long, some of them, so. They are 10 years. Um, the judges are, up, are uh, after 10 years, are run for retention, and we also have a role in that. We also evaluate judges for retention. It's, it's done somewhat differently, and, and it's we do it through a, we call it a, a plebiscite. We have lawyers who, who have appeared before the judges who evaluate them, and, and um, depending on the outcome of that, we, we you know it's a it's a, it's a different process because we the judges have a track record on the bench at that point as opposed to people who are practicing law who may not have a you know and and so so we haven't you know we're, we're looking ahead to what they're going to be able how they're going to be able to serve the public that's good information can you um just tell our listeners briefly the difference between commons pleas and municipal court it, it's it's a jurisdictional. I guess it, it, they're different. It's a di okay. It's a different jurisdiction. The uh, I'll give you just a few examples. Preliminary hearings and, and certain crim certain certain criminal matters are handled in municipal court, but then eventually they end up in common pleas court. 
if you have a um, housing, you know, tenant, landlord, tenant, those matters start out in municipal court, they can find their way eventually into common pleas court. In many cases, um, cases get appealed. If you, if someone doesn't like the outcome of the in, in municipal court, they get appealed to to common pleas court. The um, in a, in the case of a civil dispute, the amount, the the jurisdictional limit, the amount of money you you are able to recover, for example, is very different. It's much lower in in municipal court, and also you can represent yourself in municipal court in small claims court. Um, while you can represent yourself in common pleas court, it's a much more complicated matter. So there there are significant differences, but in many in many and and but there but but being a judge in either one of them is extremely important. Yes, that is important, especially for municipal court, which is probably where most people have their first encounter. Well, that's right? what it, you know. Many people call it the people's court, <laughs> and Indeed. it and it is. It's the average. It's it's anyone you know. You you can you have an issue. You go to you can file something in small claims court and represent yourself. So that's that's very true, and 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 so the matters are are different, but they're equally, but they're important. Whatever issue you have in front of a court, if you're as a litigant, it's it's really important to you. And and sometimes you know members of public even if you haven't it it may be that you've never been in court and you I hope never to be but when you are you will be very happy that you and and you will be very happy that you, you voted for a highly recommend or recommended judge. <laughs> Indeed, um, are there any other resources or elements of the of your work at the bar association that you want to inform the public about? Well, right now, one of the things we're very, you know, we're really interested in is, 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 we're, you know, we have a, we care about social justice, we care about the underserved, and one of the important, um, one, one, a very important advocacy piece for us right now is, is helping people have access to counsel in important matters that, um, you know, important matters um, and, and circumstances when they can't afford counsel. We all hear about. Um, right to counsel in criminal cases. It's the, it's the, the case was, um, um, but 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 in, in civil cases, there's not necessarily a right to counsel. And we have had a civil Gideon task force, and Gideon is Gideon versus Wainwright is the case that 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 gave rise to the the rise the right to counsel in criminal cases. Um, that we hope to be able to, you know, we've been advocating now for 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 a decade. In finding ways for people who um, who have important important rights at stake who can't afford attorney an ability to get them, so sir, um, that's a long way of, of, of reaching my point. That this that um, last year at the end of last year we um, we commissioned a report by um, a group called Stout which which assessed the economic benefits of providing counsel to low income tenants facing eviction to the city. And you know, bottom line is that for for um, if the city invested three point five million dollars in in funding council, the savings would be like forty three million dollars. So there's a real strong um, return on the you know return on the investment if the city were able to do that. And we're advocating, we're hoping that the city in, uh, makes in this budget make a sub makes substantial funding for that initiative. Shelley, I want to thank you for all the work that you're doing and and organizing all of these people to vet these candidates yeah. and give the public information about them. Um, again, the website is philadelphiabar.org, and you can learn more about the Judicial Commission by clicking on the link to that. And if you will give them the website for the um, the other uh, page that you have. Electqualifiedjudges.com. Okay, so electqualifiedjudges.com, and there you will find more information about the candidates who are running in the election for judge. And then again, you can see if people are recommended or highly recommended, and hopefully that will inform your decision when you're at the voting booth. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of the People Power Lunch Hour Show. Again, I'm your host, Vanessa Maria Graber. This whole month, we'll be talking about elections, so stay tuned in two weeks. We'll be back with an all-new episode. If you'd like to see this episode and all of our episodes of the People Power Lunch Hour Show, you can visit our website at phillycam.org. We'll also be posting our video voter guide. If you go to our social media pages, you'll see a recording of the People's Forum. We're trying to give you everything that you need to stay informed and civically engaged. Thank you so much for listening and watching.